All right, everybody. How are you doing tonight? Good, good. Glad to see you all here. I've got a good full room for this. This is going to be a great show. Um, welcome to the Focal Point. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm a volunteer here among quite a few of us here tonight. All of the volunteer, all of the people who help you get in and seated and all that are volunteers. Nobody has ever taken a paycheck for that Focal Point. So, going on 50 years. Yeah, thanks. I think that's a pretty incredible feat. 50 years of doing this, and it's just basically getting together and having fun. So, Lil Rev has been here before. Um, a couple of times, I believe, um, and I think it's all pre-pandemic. I don't think he's been here since then, um, but he's he's going to put on a, a great show tonight. I, I think you all, if you're here, you obviously know a little bit about him. So uh, he's going to be joined tonight by a local artist, uh, Tom Palazzola. Um, if you've ever heard of the Flea Bitten Dogs, um, local band, Tom's. That's Tom. So. Anyway, I think I'll uh, turn this over to them and let them entertain us. Thanks a lot for coming. situated here. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to start out. Uh, how many ukulele players do we have here tonight? Wow. Quite a few are willing to admit it. I'm going to start out on the baritone uke. A lot of instruments up here on the stage. Uh, I've been here a couple times before, as uh, uh, as he mentioned. Um, one uh, one year, I was booked here in the winter time and um, drove through a pretty bad snowstorm in Illinois and slid off the road. Um, oh, yeah. I wound up sitting in the ditch for about six hours. And, uh, um, needless to say, I didn't make I didn't make it. So I'm glad to be here. And I did drive through that that storm that just moved across the country. So it, it, it crossed my mind that. <laughs> What the heck is going on? <laughs> that would have been weird. All right. Well, I'm going to start off with an original instrumental piece that just a nice little warm-up for me uh, that I call Sosa Salute. This was made by um, Kanalea Ukuleles of Hawaii, and uh, I'm endorsed by them, and uh, the, per the, the guy who founded the company's name is Joe Sosa. And... Uh, so this is the third instrument they built for me, and I wanted to write a, a tune to honor, honor the family and uh, the Ohana, and and so this is a piece that I wrote in kind of a slack key style. If you play ukulele, that's kind of a whole Hawaiian tradition on uh, uh, guitar and slide and a bunch of other things. And then I'm going to segue into a Bruce Utah Phillips song. Utah Phillips is a great American songwriter, and uh, I'm going to do a tune from him called uh, the Hymn Song or I believe, and it says, I believe if I live my life again, I'd still be here with you. I believe if I live my life again, I'd still be here with you. That's gonna be your part, okay? Can you handle that? Can I hear you say that? Uh, just for that, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna give you a second to think about that. Did you, you guys didn't really want to have to work too hard tonight, did you? Yeah. I'm doing all the work, okay. You'll get it once you hear it, trust me, okay. I'll add a little harmonic to this, too. You don't want to have too many regrets in this lifetime. And I, I do have to say that um, I definitely have been throwing some curveballs along the way. And... Uh, 
but I won't have to get to the end with too many regrets. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. I got a close friend who uh, said he's got about six months to live. Here, it's liver cancer. to be a rocker but nobody believes me. still be wagering the same, uh, you know, 
same energy but sticking around that uh, she always has. I think about that when I sing this last verse, you know. I'll never see the ending of my mind. Everything must have a time. Well, should I ask for things that I don't need? Oh, foolish lies to hide my greed. Ready? I believe if I live my life again, I'd still be here with you. Oh, say it again now, now. I believe if I live my life again, I'd still be here with you. I'd still be hard a droopy harmonica rack that slips away from your lips and you can't that's not cool at all so there ain't gonna be no harmonica in this song this time. <laughs> Everybody put your hands together for Tom from the Flea Bitten Dogs. All right. Well, it's an honor to share, share the stage here with my buddy and make a little music together. We're going we're gonna to do another little ukulele thing here. This is sort of uh, mandatory fair when you are a blues fan and you find yourself in this town. <laughs> that is if you want to be respectful of the tradition all right so we're going to go from a original to a folk song to a blues song this was written by wc handy i don't know, back in the teens sometime i think you ready brother yep Let me take it around one time, okay? Saint Louis won't is trying to be what 
what she ain't. Oh, say it now. I got the St. Louis blues. I'm as blue as I could be. St. Louis blues. I'm blue as I could be. these instruments are just props. But we, I don't actually play all these instruments. They just make the stage look really cool so I carry them around the country. Let's see here. We're going to play a little bit of guitar here. I'm a big bluegrass fan. I, I spent a lot of time teaching at music festivals and music camps, a lot of bluegrass camps. And uh, so I'd like to play a bluegrass tune for you. This is uh, from Bill Monroe, the father of bluegrass. Oh, let's see here. I can see you guys like singing. So. <laughs> <laughs> or as one folk singer once said, the louder you sing, the better I sound. <laughs> All right. This is called Red Apple Juice. I ain't got no use for your red apple juice. I ain't got no sugar. I ain't got no sugar baby now. Or some sometimes I'll say I ain't got no honey baby now, which is not true.
Y'all ready? Okay. Here we go. I don't know if I'm ready. Okay, there we go. piece for you guys. We have any harmonica players here tonight? All one of you? <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. We only need, You'll we enjoy it. We only need one person to see. They play harmonica. I play a little guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take you on back to the, to the late 20s and uh, do a little tune for you from a guy named uh, Jaybird Coleman. And this was an era when record labels were um, <laughs> pretty naive. They thought that the gold ticket was, you know, that these incredible harmonica players who would just pretty much accompany themselves, you know, were, was actually going to sell, you know, it was going to translate into some, you know, financial remuneration for the OK and the Columbia and all these different record labels, Paramount and all these record labels that record a lot of blues. And, um, you know, most of these records didn't sell, sell much at all. And, uh, but for those of us who came, you know, here we are now, you know, 
getting on close to 100 years later, you know, um, and we play these instruments like the harmonica, you listen to these timeless 70 re scratchy old recordings, and it's otherworldly what these guys were doing just all by themselves with the harmonica. The sounds they would wrench out of these little 10-hole diatonic instruments just still fascinates me. And uh, this is called the Man Trouble Blues. And uh, I'll play this, dedicate this to any fellows in the house who are in the doghouse tonight. So, <laughs> treat your ladies right and you wouldn't be in this situation. <laughs> And one might add just, you know, anyone who's in the doghouse, irregardless of their gender. <laughs> When a man gets in trouble, everybody throws him down. And it's hey, 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 hey. I was down in my jail cell, fell down on my knee. Yeah, I, I did have to pay extra to be up in this seat. <laughs> the best seat in the house. <laughs> I got, always got to wet my whistle after I do that. And uh, um, that's uh, all that vibrato stuff. Um, there's a real price to pay when you're a singer and you like to do that stuff. Cause I've been doing it on the road the last few days. It, it, if you watch my neck, now this is this is something that you never see an artist doing from the stage because I look like a complete, you know, geek when I do this. Okay, so watch my neck right here just so you understand why my voice will get poppy tonight after doing that. So just watch my neck muscles. <laughs> See that? That's shaking. So you learn to control that after a while, after you've been doing harmonica for a long time, and it kind of takes that pitch and it shakes it in your whole oral cavity, but it, it wrecks havoc on your vocal cords, so there's a price to pay, which means I'll probably end up doing a lot of blues tonight. So. <laughs> All right. Looking for me somewhere. E e. Can you read it? Yeah. Oh, that's the other D. Yeah. <laughs> How many of you guys are in love tonight? How many of you would like to be in love before the night is through? There's <laughs> always a few of those. I'm, I'm a pretty lucky guy, and a lot of my regular fans know they know my story, you know. And um, you know, I, I got married, had a kid, and uh, thought I was going to spend the rest of my life, you know, with my my first wife, and uh, and then life threw me a curveball. I um, you know, come off the road and ended up taking care of my wife for about 10 months. Uh, she had lung cancer. 
and uh, I learned a million lessons that that whole year about life and and uh, so you know you sign on you say I do and you think it's going to be forever but um, there's no guarantees you know in love and uh, and I did the best I could and uh, and then I found myself a single dad with a six-year-old girl and uh, I, I that wasn't what I had originally signed up for you know but uh, um, a very good friend of mine who's a very religious man and I'm certainly not the most deserving person in the room but but he said little Rev God gives you what you need when you need it most and I'm not worried about you because you my friend have got a lot of good karma you've been spreading a lot of love around the country and and I bet it's gonna come back to you in a big way and about three months later I'm, I'm playing at a music festival with about I don't know seven or eight other acts and and I, I do my little 20 minutes of fame and I get off the stage and I go to Hawk CDs and and this beautiful brown-haired girl comes running up to me and does something that I hadn't seen a girl do in front of me since like third grade on the playground. She comes running up to me and she goes... <laughs> <laughs> and like I, I had to like step back and, um, and I was like, Jenny? She was like, Rev, I didn't even know you were going to be here. A friend of mine talked me into coming tonight. You know, I I had no clue you were going to be. I, it was my high school sweetheart. I hadn't seen her in 30 years. Wow. Yeah. And uh, and she looked so beautiful, just, just as beautiful as, you know, I remember her. And uh, so we started following each other on Facebook, and then eventually we eventually we met for coffee, and and then th that, that led to another meeting for coffee and another meeting for coffee, and... And then one day we're sitting there and we're having coffee and uh, and I say to her, you know, our timing sucks. And she looks at me and says, well, well, I don't quite see it that way. I said, well, how do you see it? She said, well, I already lost you once. I don't want to lose you again. Now, you've got to remember, my daughter had a separation anxiety, you know, was just going through hell after losing her mother. And here I am, a single dad with a broken heart. And, uh, um, and I always thought I was a pretty tough dude, you know, but there I am in the coffee house, like betwixt and between, because, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, brokenhearted for the love that I thought I'd spend the rest of my life with. And here I am with like love staring me right in the eyes again. And, you know, I'm raw and brokenhearted all at once. It's a very strange place to be, you know, and, uh, I already lost you once. I don't want to lose you again. But what do you do with that, you know? And and uh, she is the daughter of a firefighter. And when I was a teenager, I used to spend a lot of time at her house. And her parents, unlike other girls that I dated, her parents trusted me. <laughs> <laughs> and I deserved to be trusted. I don't know why anybody was suspicious of me because I've always tried to be a gentleman, you know. And uh, and I spent a lot of time getting to know them, you know. And, uh, and her father was like this heroic firefighter who was a guy that ran into the burning buildings when nobody else was willing to, you know. And uh, you might think he was crazy, but he is a, a Vietnam veteran who came home with two Purple Hearts and way too much adrenaline from the war. So what did he do? He signed up to be a firefighter and spent the rest of his life doing that. You know, double whammy for serving first your country, then, then your community, you know. And... Uh, and I looked at her and I said, you're definitely the daughter of a firefighter because all the other girls would run away from my life right now. You know, I'm, you know, I'm a train wreck. And, uh, and there you are. You're, you're, you're your father's daughter. You're running into a burning house. Do you realize that? You know? And, and sure, all around us, family and friends. Oh, that's a rebound. Oh, watch yourself. Oh, don't do that. Oh, everybody had, you know, you know the line, opinions are like, you know what, everybody's got one. But uh, my heart and my gut told me that was the right thing to do, and, and, and time heals everything, and I'm glad I made that decision. Three days before my first wife passed, we had this heart-to-heart, -heart and she couldn't talk. She had a tumor in her lung, and, uh, and she said, just don't get married for six months. <laughs> Maintained her sense of humor right up to the very end. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get married for six months. I got married two years later, um, but I married my high school sweetheart. 
And uh, that was the best decision I made, I tell you. I still call her my angel, you know. But uh, you know, a lot of you are wondering, Little Rev, how long does this story go on? <laughs> it hasn't ended. Another minute or two yet. So a few years after we broke up in high school, and, and we broke up for a couple of reasons, but the most prominent of which was that we, were, we had different dreams for what we wanted to do after high school. We, we didn't break up because we didn't like each other or care about it. We just moved on with our life. We weren't ready to get married and settle down. We weren't of that gener generation, you know. So a couple of years after we broke up, I'm driving down the road one night with one of my best friends, and the Bodines is one of my favorite rock bands. Um, it's playing on the radio this song, looking for me somewhere, and uh, and my buddy finally just can't take it anymore. He's like, "Little Rev, you have replayed this song about three dozen times. <laughs> you know what's going on?" I was like, "I don't know. I just I used to sing this song for Jenny, you know, and I feel like she's thinking of me right now." And he goes, "Man, he goes." I always knew you had a lot of confidence, but you are really full of yourself. <laughs> you know, you think your old girlfriend is thinking of you right now? She's out running around having a good time with somebody else. She ain't thinking about you. You know, I'm like, no, I can feel it. She's thinking about me, you know. And sure enough, a couple times over the years, our paths almost crossed. A whole bunch of times we thought about each other and it almost was like the same time. So let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever thought of a friend, a family member, or someone that you were thinking about and all of a sudden in the next 24 hours you get a call from them? How many of you ever had that experience? Okay. Yeah. Happens all the time. We're more connected than you realize. And when we started talking about it, she told me all the time she thought about me and, and it was like, I was right. She was thinking about me. You know, she was thinking about me. I couldn't help but, you know, think about this song from back in my teenage years and start singing it again, you know. Out of town, I dream about a girl out there in the world looking for, she's looking for me somewhere, looking for me somewhere. I know, looking for me high and looking low on a live and die, it seems as a waste without a dream. Looking for, looking for me somewhere. Heard her sing once at the rodeo. Wore a rhinestone suit of white and gold. She sang and she played. Stole my heart away. She's looking for, she's looking for me somewhere. You want to sing it with me? Looking for me somewhere I know. Looking for me high and looking low Hard to live and die it seems A waste without a dream Looking for, she's looking for me somewhere That's right, it's not over yet, you were right Hang on that one chord <laughs> So the reason why I tell that story and Just as I did last night in Kansas City and someone came up to me and told me this story about his his 50th high school reunion. He he got reacquainted with a girl that he had a crush on. They never dated, but they, he had a crush on her in uh, in high school. He said, and uh, they started talking about gardening. And he said, well, I got a bumper crop of green beans this year. And she said, you ought to can them then. He goes, oh, I haven't done much canning. He goes, she goes, why don't you come on over and I'll, I'll show you how. He said, we canned green beans, you know, for months at a time. 
He said eventually in the fall when there were no more green beans, we ended up getting married. <laughs> As the morning sun begins to rise No, I go to bed and I close my eyes Dream about a girl Out there in the world Looking for, she's looking for me somewhere Come on Looking for me somewhere I know Looking for me high and looking low Without a dream, she's looking for, looking for me somewhere. guitar here and then we'll get back to some uke or mando or mountain dulcimer we'll see what comes up next so i'll give, give you one more here on the guitar so the last song is by the bodines not exactly a traditional band but uh i imagined when i heard that song i imagined that it was a song not unlike what the carter family could have written and uh and so uh, it sounded like that to me fit right right in so now we're gonna do one from uh Another songwriter who I bet has had his song sung on this stage countless times, and his name was Towns Van Zant. And uh, I'm a, I'm a kind of a Towns Van Zant jukebox. Um, tonight, one or two of them. But uh, I had one opportunity to hear Towns Van Zant when I really got hip to his music, um, and found out about him, fell in love with it. It was you know pretty close to the the end of his road. And um, he had come to Madison, Wisconsin to play. And so I drove the 90 miles from Milwaukee where I was living to Madison and uh, went, went with a good buddy of mine and, you know, just wide eyed, you know, and uh, I've, been, I've been writing songs since seventh grade. So, you know, it's like to hear somebody whose songs you hear and you just can't get them out of your head and you forget them, you know, you can't forget them, you know, it's like, um, you know, it was a dream to be there that night and uh, hear one of my heroes. So there I am, waiting for the show to start. The guy barely can get up on the stage. He's so, he's so damn schnockered and even funny, you know. And then he puts the guitar in his lap. He can barely play his guitar. He's just falling over, you know. And that ain't really the way that I wanted to remember him, you know, because uh, uh, he wasn't around much longer after that. And um, must have been in a lot of pain that he needed to self-medicate like that. So. Anyways, uh, I still love him. I still love his music. Everybody gets three strikes in my book, so that was his first one. I sing this for a good pal of mine. That's the real reason why I learned it, because he's, he's the best diesel mechanic I've ever met. And I know a few of them. And uh, um, when people can't figure things out, they go to him. He works on freight liners. Um, and, uh, and I had to start thinking about all the songs I knew that had trucks in them. <laughs> you know, so he'd show up at all my gigs, and I'd be like, i got to play a song about you know, trucking. You know? And he wasn't too thrilled when I sang Smokey and the Bandit one night. <laughs> <laughs> so I sang, sang this, I learned this, and I sang it for me. He was really happy because he works on these trucks, but I have not had the heart to tell him it's not really about freight liners. <laughs> so this is called White Freight Liner, and uh, I'll do this one for you guys. I'll put a big round of applause for this guy sitting there looking at it, making everything sound better. Oh, no, 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 no. See, I'm trying to hide back here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. White Freight Liner. Hit it. 
Houston, Lord, have my friends are dying. Bad news from Houston, Lord, have my friends are dying. White freight line, oh, won't you steal away my mind? Lord, I'm gonna ramble till I get back to where I some money the rev so far. Yeah. All right, you feel like playing a little percussion on this one? Sure. All right. Well, I was thinking about playing another instrument, but I think I feel like playing a guitar again. <laughs> so many options, so. <laughs> Yeah, I think I gotta play the guitar on this. I, I do. You gotta be careful when you get all these ukulele players coming and you don't play enough ukulele, they get restless. <laughs> Bad things can happen to a performer if you don't play enough ukulele. So I promise uke after this one if there's enough time left in this set. So. <laughs> think about this for a second here. Uh, I'm going to try out a new song on you guys. Are you guys okay with that? Okay. All right. This is traditional arts, and so I don't want to break any of the rules. It doesn't say you can't do new songs in the contract. I got a uh, uh, buddy from high school. Um, who served in Iraq, and um, 
I would have been right there with him had it not been for a bad car accident that knocked me. I had to get a medical discharge. I was uh, I was signed up for the Marine Corps Reserve, and I had already begun my training when uh, somebody ran a red light and T-boned the side of my car, ruptured a disc in my back, messed me up, and I, I couldn't couldn't do the training I needed to do. Put me on a different trajectory. I wound up going to college, getting a degree in education, became a, became a, a grade school music teacher and a college lecturer for a good number of years before I just couldn't do a nine to five job anymore. And, um, and it was about that time that I realized, you know, you're, Lil Rev, you're a musician, man. You belong out on the road. That's, that's who you are. Don't fight that just because all your heroes work nine to five. You know, <laughs> it took a little time. I had to work through some things. But anyways, so my buddy, um, he got some shrapnel on his body, and, and, he, and, he, and he ain't going to get it out, you know, so that means that he lives with some chronic pain, and uh, he does all kind of things to kind of keep moving, keep functioning, and maybe you know somebody, not that, that, not that has shrapnel on their body, but somebody who lives with chronic pain, and, um, you know, every day is, is this challenge to stay in the world, you know, and not have to, like, check out too much, but medicate enough that you can function. And we tend to, to judge a lot of these people, and a lot of times we don't even know they're dealing with chronic pain. You know, they come to my shows when I'm playing at clubs, and whereas, you know, someone I know drinks one or two drinks, they'll drink four or five, you know, um, and a lot of other things. But I really started thinking about this when my father-in-law um, passed away, uh, who I was talking about earlier. Um, and he, he, you know, he had pancreatitis later in his life. So when you go to visit him, he would literally be sitting there like this, going like this, just in so much pain. He was on morphine. And this is, this is the ultimate wrong in an era where cannabis is legal. And uh, a lot of people are using it medically, and it's, it seems to be helping them. But um, he wasn't sleeping well, and, he was, uh, and his appetite sucked. So he started smoking dope, and he'd always been a, against it, you know, a lot, a lot, most of his life. But he realized that it was helping him. And then one day they did a urine test because he was, you know, prescribed morphine. And they said, you got to choose. You can't have both of these, you know. And it's against the law in Wisconsin where we were, you know, where we live. So, you know, he was made to choose between his morphine, which was killing the pain, and marijuana, which was helping him sleep and helping him eat and all that other stuff. When I found out about that, I, you know, I wanted to put my fist to the wall because here was somebody who, who served their country, served their community, to tell someone like that, a great American, you know, who really has given it all, you know, that they can't use this this natural plant that it seems to be helping people, and plenty of people abuse it too, you know. So, but you know, if anybody deserved to use it, it was him, you know. It really rubbed me the wrong way, you know, and uh, and I thought about all these people, including one of my fans back in. Sheboygan where I live who can't stand up straight because he's got bone on bone, you know, and his knees are shot and he's too old to have knee surgery. So when he stands, it looks like he's leaning literally backwards. You know, I shouldn't, shouldn't have a little chuckle in there, but you know, it's, um, he's living with chronic pain and, uh, and all these people do different things to try to make it through the day, you know. Some of them drink alcohol, some of them smoke too much dope, some of them take pills, and, and I'm not going to be the one to judge them. No way, man. You know, so unless you've lived with their pain, you got no right. You know, should they overindulge from time to time? So here's to the mobility that we all take for granted every day. And take that from the guy who played in nursing homes for 30 years. You know, you all made it here tonight. Did, did you ever stop to think just that alone is for some people a dream? A dream. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a beat-up martial arts guy. I'll, I'm probably going to be a hip candidate, hip replacement candidate in a few years here. So I get it. But I'm not in that. I'm not in pain, you know. So here's a tune called The Ballad of a Pill Popper. And if I hadn't told you that, you would have taken that title the wrong way. So... <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here in St. Louis tonight, you guys. You guys are a great audience. Thank you so much. Bottle of wine, Hadville too. There's lots of things I might choose. THC, 
CBD, these things was made for you and me. Just trying to make it through. Oh, how about you? Just trying to make it through. You do the same thing too. Just trying to make it through. Oh, another day. There's whiskey man, bourbon too. This drink was made for me and you. There's Delta Eight, nine and ten. I'm walking the dog. It's my best friend. Just trying to make it through. Oh, how about you? Just trying to make it through. You do the same thing too. Just trying to make it through. Oh, another day. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Lord knows I tried just to keep it clean. Time goes by. And the body keeps score until one day you can't do what you did before. never sleeps and it brings some pain just trying to make it through oh how about you just trying to make it through you do the same thing too just trying to make it through oh, another day now you might think I'm a little bit intense. All the drugs that I take don't make no sense. But I tell you now, I'm a God-fearing man. And the Lord, he said, son, do the best you can. God forbid you ever feel my pain. You'll never judge another man when he chooses not to abstain. Just trying to make it through. Oh, how about you? Just trying to make it through. You do the same thing too. Just trying to make it through. Oh, another day. Like it or launch it? I figure everybody knows someone like that, right? All right, so I want to take you guys back to the 1970s, early 70s. I don't know what this was, 71 or somewhere around there. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, 
southern rock largely because it often had a lot of blues fused into it. So, you know, Allman Brothers and uh, uh, Leonard Skinner and what I'm not listening to old string band music from the 20s and 30s. You know, it's uh, some of my favorite stuff to listen to. And we're going to do a ukulele rendition of uh, Can't You See Me? Yeah, yeah, grab your uke, yeah. Is that okay? Okay. All right. So you you probably never heard it this way. But, uh, um, then again, that's how we roll. Can't you see? I, I like Marsh, Marshall Tucker because um, there are very few bands that incorporated flute into their sound. You just didn't hear that other than like Jethro Tull, right? You know, and, uh, and they did it very tastefully. You know. I'm going to do what they did on the flute. I'm going to do on my harmonica. I'm going to play that flute line. And uh, I'll even start out on my ukulele a little bit with a little bit of that flute riff as well. And, uh, and you guys can sing along if you like. Like that squeaky chair? <laughs> Old rocking chair. <laughs> it's just all operating all on its own accord. <laughs> all right. I think I'm happy now. All right. Let me play this little intro here.
catch me a southbound All the way to Georgia long I don't care how long we roll Buy me a ticket now Far as I can, yeah Jump off, nobody gonna know Come on Can't you see? Can't you see? What they I think that's a good spot to take a break. Am I right about that in terms of the time back there? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I will come off the stage in just a moment, and I'll be standing in the back by CDs and stuff, and I will commune with you, the masses. Okay? So thank you for coming out tonight. I hope you'll stick around another set, okay? Um, on May 4th, we are doing a um, fundraiser for Focal, Focal Point. Um, and it's not going to be your average come in and sit down and watch a show. We're going to have tables with tablecloth and food and drink. And uh, we're... Um, auction items. We've got auction items. Um, if anybody has something that they want to contribute um, in, the, in the auction uh, realm... I I've practically cleared out my house of extraneous. <laughs> yeah. So anything would help. I mean, uh, I think I think Tom, who builds his little uh, percussion things, um, he's volunteered to build something for us um, for the auction. So that'll be fun. <laughs> what did I miss? <laughs> so. Um, anyway, on the May on May fourth, the um, tickets are a hundred dollars, um, but that includes the drinks and the food and the music and uh, just being a part of Focal Point. And uh, you, could I say something that I don't think we say very often? January next year, this their fifth anniversary. This will be the first live well, the uh, fundraiser that we have ever done. There you go. We first, know. first. Uh, fundraiser that we've done in 49 years wow. so um, we've been able to keep it going but this is going to do things that um, we're hoping to do some special things during our 50th year um, which that means bringing in some people that maybe we wouldn't have been able to do before uh, so anyway that's all um, we're just kind of asking you to help out uh, if you want to join us on May 4th um, you can check out uh, you she's got a up at the table in the back if you're interested or you can ask a, for an email if you invite if you want to think about it. yeah so anyway um, like I said go to the focal point.org check out the shows that are coming up and uh, I think I'll quit talking now we'll turn it back over to Rev, thanks. Thank you, buddy. I'll make sure I leave a little, little Rev swag for you guys, too. I'm going to start on the Mountain Dulcimer in this set. And I'd like to dedicate these. I'm going to do uh, 
two instrumentals. One was really kind of a sweet, pretty, kind of almost semi-spiritual kind of tune uh, called South Wind, or composed by Turlough Carolyn, a, a Celtic uh, Irish harp player, blind uh, harp player who would write tunes for the people who would take care of him, put him up when he'd be traveling around. A, a troubadour in the real sense uh, from the days of old. And then, then I'm going to segue into an American fiddle tune called Bonaparte's Retreat. And I'd like to dedicate this mel melody, uh, these two melodies to Aiden, who just passed uh, recently to his memory. for you on the ukulele here and pacify the angry masses. <laughs> Thank you. Boy, do they take good care of the artists here. Look at them. <laughs> well, I, I hinted at earlier in the night that I wasn't joking. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I'll be 56 this year, um, there's a folk singer in Milwaukee, uh, David Drake. And, uh, and I started asking him, I said, you know, how, how do you make a living doing this? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you make a living with your music? And he said, well, he said, well, you know, you gotta have a program. Got to create a program, and he was doing this history of Wisconsin and song and story, and he'd go into the schools and and teach the kids about you know Wisconsin history and you know how it came to be the logging and the fishing and the the Great Lakes and all this this uh, history, and uh, he said you know and sometimes I'll play in nursing homes and places like that and. Um, and anywhere else I can get a gig, you know. He said, you ought to play in the nursing homes. You know a lot of fun old songs, you know. So I said, really, they pay you to go and play in the nursing homes? He said, yeah, yeah. 
back in those days, it was like 50 bucks, you know, for an hour or whatever. So, so he said, I'll just open up the yellow pages. Remember those, the yellow pages? <laughs> and uh, so open up the yellow page and start calling the nursing home and tell them, you know, what you do and, and ask for the activity director and, you know, just tell them you do a variety of music. And sure enough, he was right. I, before I knew it, I was like playing in nursing homes like four or five days a week. I'm not kidding you. You know, and the, and back in those days, even though I was only getting paid 50, 75 bucks a pop, it, it, the money went further than it does today. You know, it was it $300 for a bag of groceries today? You know, I mean, that's how it feels. But um, anyways, uh, what I soon realized was that when I would go to the nursing home, I would always meet somebody who had some great story to tell or some somebody who just had a very interesting life and they would come up and just disclose all this stuff. So if I wasn't in a hurry and I really took the time to listen to our elders, you would deserve that. And they were really lonely people, you know. Half the time nobody would come to see them for weeks or months and they deserve that, you know. So I grew up spending every weekend with my grandparents and I didn't realize how great it was until they were gone, you know. And so I thought this is the best thing ever. I get to play in the nursing home, you know. And my friends would make fun of me. They'd say, Little Rev, you're the king of the nursing home circuit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't care. I was proud of that, you know. And, and these days I don't do quite so much as I used to, but I still do play in uh, nursing homes, retirement homes and whatnot, veterans homes, assisted living, independent, uh, memory care, all this stuff. And uh, one day I'm playing in this place called Mount Carmel which is now doesn't exist because the, the state shut it down because they had too many violations. And, uh, and I get done, I'm packing up my stuff, and this guy, I see this guy coming up from across the room, he's wheeling himself up there. It looks like he's working really hard, I mean really hard to get up to the front of the room. And then he comes right up to the stage as I'm putting my guitar away in the case. He looks at me and in this very contorted, distorted kind of facial expression, he holds up his finger, reminding you there's a little piece of drool kind of hanging down, just dangling, waiting to fall. And he goes, you did the, the Ashtabula upstroke. <laughs> and then before I could say, what is the Ashtabula upstroke? He puts one hand on the wheel and goes like that and spins his wheelchair around, like real quick, blew me away. I was like, wow, that was a sweet move, you know? <laughs> And then he's, he wheeled himself out of the room. And so I finished packing up. I get out to my car. And, uh, and I, at that point in time, I was crazy about like the vaudeville era. And so I was studying a lot of strumming techniques. And I was trying to figure out how the ukulele sounded the way it did on all these old records. And I didn't know it at the time, but guys like Roy Schmeck, you know, they were going, they were going. Doing all these like geometric strums, zigzag strums, and triple strums. All these syncopated things. And it's all this really cool stuff. And I was trying to figure it out. And then I go I, to myself, well, hold it. He said stroke, the Ashtabula upstroke. I hadn't heard about that, and I had every old, you know, flea market, antique mall, ukulele book in my collection that you could have possibly. Nobody ever said nothing about the Ashtabula upstroke. So as I drove away, I find myself upset that I didn't, like, chase the guy down, you know. Maybe he knew something that I didn't, and I wanted to know it, you know. And it haunted me, you know. Years went by, and I never forgot about that moment. You know, one one night I'm laying in bed, and I'm married, and, and I have a kid, and, and I'm just laying there, and I can't sleep. It must be about midnight, and my wife is fast asleep, and I, I just, I'm just thinking about this again, you know. And, I'm like, and, and so I lean over, and I, I kind of put my, my mouth right by her ear, and I go, baby, just like that. And she's like, mm. you know, and I get a little closer to her, and I go, Sugar. Just snoring away, you know, just like, you know. Finally, I put my hand on her shoulder, you know, I lean in and give her a kiss on her cheek, and I say, Darling. She goes, What? 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 Why, why did you wake me? I was like, Something's bothering me. She goes, well, well, what, What's wrong? I go, I know how to do the Ashtabula upstroke. <laughs> my night didn't get any better 
fact, she was upset with me. <laughs> and uh, so fast forward, many months go by. I'm doing my annual Florida tour, which, you know, I'd stay in Florida for a while and then go on and do my winter tour. And uh, we're driving through Port St. Lucie. And my wife's behind the wheel. I'm in the back seat serenading my kid, who's like the size of a football, you know. And 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 I'm just trying to be entertaining, and I'm noodling and making things up. And and she's just laying there in the little kid seat, going, <laughs> you know, like that. And and uh, it seems to be working, you know. And all of a sudden, my wife goes, "What did you just play?" I said, "I don't know. I just made it up." She goes, don't play that again. I, I recognize that. That's really cool. So I played it again. She goes, oh, yeah, I have heard that before. I said, sweetie, you have not heard that melody. I just made it up. I'm noodling around. She said, play it one more time. I'm positive I've heard it before. So I play it again. She goes, oh, yeah, I recognize that. And I go, you're such a smart, you know what, explicative right there. And she goes, no, I'm telling you, I know what that is. I said, well, what is it? She said, sounds like the Ash to Beulah upstroke. <laughs> So, anyways, I, I Googled it too. Nothing, you know, it's just like, so. Uh, anyways, here's all the old folks who came and, you know, taught me something about what it, you know, what it means to be an American and, and all their great contributions to this country and all the things that I learned along the way and all the things that, you know, maybe I still don't understand, but uh, what the heck, it makes, makes for good feed for the fodder when you're an entertainer, I'll tell you that. So here's the Ashtabula upstroke. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, the best I could do is think about ragtime. So this has kind of got a very ragtime feel to it. And I was just in Kansas City, which has got a really rich ragtime history. So here we go. The Ashtabula Upstroke. Hey, welcome my buddy Tom to the stage here, everybody. All right. All right, well, we're going to kind of start this set the way we did the last set. We're going to start with a tune that I first heard played by a guy named Blind Boy Fuller. If anybody's ever listen to much pre-war uh, acoustic blues. Um, Blind Boy Fuller had a real ragtimey kind of feel to, uh, to his playing. And uh, a lot of these guys ended up coming up to Wisconsin because in not far from where I live in Sheboygan is a town called Grafton. And there was a furniture factory there. 
and um, and Paramount Records used to record all the old blues men and women. So they'd come up to Wisconsin. Sometimes they'd even stick around. And in fact, it was just you know not that long ago that they discovered in a potter's grave one of the all-time great blues guitarists, Blind Blake. Um, laying in an unmarked grave, you know, and everybody raised some money and gave him a proper headstone and whatnot. And I know a lot of people make that pilgrimage to go visit his gravesite. So um, here's a, a tune from that tradition, and it's called the Weeping Willow Blues. <laughs> Sing it with me, weeping will. Ready? 
weeping willow and the morning's on Hey, give it up for this guy. Sometimes you're the bullet and sometimes you're the windshield. That's right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Love all that old music. One uh, songwriter I've, I've been a fan of probably since the very first time I heard any of his music. And uh, it's a fellow. A Jewish kid from up in uh, the north country of Minnesota, in the iron ore country. And, uh, uh, his name is Robert Zimmerman. <laughs> he wanted to be like Woody Guthrie, so he went, went east, found himself in Greenwich Village with all the folkies during the folk scare. And uh, oh, I shall be with it. This is another one we can send out to the memory of Eden. I don't know if he liked Bob Dylan or not, but... Uh... I, uh, I am not a rich man, but I try to support causes that I believe in. And so you got to always try to be giving something back, no matter what, how much money you make in this lifetime. And uh, I wish I had a lot more money because I sure like to give away a lot more of it too, you know. But uh, I do what I can. And uh, there are a few few causes that I really believe in. And uh, I am such a, you know, man, how should I say it? I just love my freedom, you know. I, that's why I thrive on the road. I, I, I love um, coming and going, being in a different place every day. And uh, fortunately, I can do that because I also know that I'll be safe in the harbor, you know, in these short little jaunts that I go out on the road. And I get to come home to a beautiful wife and a daughter and a community that I'm very much a part of. And that's what makes being on the road pretty easy, you know. But uh, um, I think if anybody ever asked me a strange question, Little Rev, what would be the worst thing that could ever happen to you? The worst thing. Like, what is the absolute worst thing that could ever happen to you? That would, like, just kill your spirit immediately. And I, you know, I thought, I'd think, well, that's a strange question, you know, but I think it would be getting incarcerated for something that I did not do. Being blamed for something I did not do. I remember when you were a kid and, you know, things would happen, somebody would try to put the blame on you, you know. Mom, I didn't do that, honestly, <laughs> you know. But uh, so I support an organization called the Innocence Project. They, they often will use DNA evidence to free people who've been in prison for 20, 30 years. And uh, and mind you, some of my best friends are cops and sheriffs too. So, you know, I, I, uh, I'm i always talking about this kind of stuff. And it happens, you know, it happens. People, you know, find themselves behind bars for long periods of time and then you can't get that time back anymore, you know. So uh, this is a song that Bob Dylan wrote about that. You know, and then you'll hear that in the lyrics if you listen to it. But I think it transcends that. I think uh, I shall be released can probably mean a lot of different things when we lay our burden down. All right. They say everything can be replayed. They say every distance is not near. 
Ask in the room for every face Every man who put me here I see my light come shining From the west down to the east Any day If it feels good, keep doing it. you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to play one more um, harmonica piece for you guys tonight. And uh, I got to tell you, it's, it is not easy to be little Reb's partner. 
This might be a romantic, you know, you know, it's kind of people like to romanticize the troubadour. Oh, it's such a great life, you know, but it's, it's hard to be wed to someone who's coming and going all the time. And, uh, um, and I imagine that would apply for the trucker or the traveling salesman or woman who's constantly hopping on planes going all over the place. Um, that is not for everybody, but, uh, but it is for me. And I couldn't change if I tried, you know. Um, but there are other things that go along with that, you know, like um, I get these fascinations, and when I get into them, i got to, like, do it full force, you know, so whatever I find myself interested in. So earlier tonight, you saw me playing through PVC pipe. Right? And and in the old days, harmonica players would find anything that would have, you know, an opening on two ends, even if they had to create it by, like, you know, breaking a bottle or uh, cans, uh, like like little tomato paste cans, those little small ones, those are awesome for, for playing your harmonica through. And the whole idea was to distort the pitch, kind of the same way we could with reverb and other effects that that go with a technology these days. In the old days, they just tried to create it through you know, physical things like this, right? And so I had a time where I was just like trying to experiment and get all these different sounds out of my harmonica with almost anything you could think of. In fact, my wife refu refuses, and, and you can ask her this, uh, next time you see her on the road with me, you know, she refuses to go into any Ace Hardware store with me. <laughs> because I've, I've been kicked out twice for playing harmonica in the store obnoxiously. And I'll, I'll, I'll just, you know, walk through the aisles and look for anything, you know, it's just, you know, a lot of plumbing joints and th things like that, you know, it's just like, and who wants to buy a plumbing joint that Little Rev slobbered all over, you know, so, you know, so, um, so one night, so, you know, warm summer night in Sheboygan, we're a couple blocks from Lake Michigan, great little neighborhood, and uh, we're, we've got a bonfire, and we like our bonfires in the summertime, sit around, have a glass of wine, and just hang out, and enjoy the weather. And, uh, and on the picnic table, we had this little, little oil lamp, you know, burning, and I noticed that the wick was, the little cloth wick was up too high, and it was scorching the inside of the, the you know, the lamp. So I, you know, there in the flickering of the fire, I walked over there and I, you know, I turned it down so that it was a little more manageable and it was working properly. And, and all of a sudden I stood there expressionless, you know, and I'm just staring at this, this little hurricane lampshade, you know. And then, mind you, out of the darkness, my wife was sitting over by the fire, out of the darkness, you know, and I'm like 30 feet away from her, you know. I hear this, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I mean, I, I'm so grateful for my wife because you know, if I, have, if I didn't have somebody, you know, like reining me in once in a while, golly knows what could happen. But uh, um, so I turned to her and I said, you know, I said, come on, baby, you know, I got to do this. <laughs> You know I got to do this, and if I don't do it now, I'll do it when you're not looking. You know, <laughs> so let you know, just help me out here, okay? I was like, will you do me a favor? Will you take this hurricane lamp shade into the house, rinse it off, get all that soot off there, just give it a quick rinse off? And she was talking about going into the house to get some snacks. So I was like, take this in the house, just rinse it out and bring it back out. Let me see what, you know, what it'll sound like. You know, <laughs> so. She goes, you know, she's, my wife is the sweetest woman in the world. And uh, so she takes it and washes it out, brings it back out, you know. And I'm, I'm holding it in my hand, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be really cool. I mean, really cool, you know. Like, like this is going to be, if you were recording, it would have been my viral moment, you know. <laughs> and I fly under the radar. I'm not looking for, like, video. Oh. video. <laughs> so, um, so, so you want to see, you want to hear what this sounds like? Okay, all right, let me wet my whistle real quick here, just because it's going to take some holler in here. All right. I think I made a believer out of her. It doesn't always happen, but I did. And then, and then I was at a loss for what I should play. Like, what should I play through this hurricane lampshade? You know, it's just like, there it is. And, um... I thought about this old Appalachian tune that I like, you know, I always used to like to play on my banjo, and it's not a fancy tune or anything, 
I'm like, let's try this and see what happens. And this is what I, this is what came out. Good old hen. She lays eggs for the railroad men. Sometimes one, sometimes two. Sometimes enough for the whole damn crew. Cluck old hen, cluck and sing. Ain't laid an egg since way last spring. Cluck old hen, cluck and squall. Ain't laid an egg since way last fall. <laughs> She had a wooden leg, best darn hen that ever laid an egg. Laid more eggs than any hen around. I reckon another snort wouldn't do me no harm. Cluck old hen, cluck and sing. Ain't laid an egg since way last spring. Cluck old hen, cluck and squall. Ain't laid an egg since way last fall. <laughs> Father Lewis he lays, lays in a little cemetery on the outskirts of uh, Sheboygan. Actually, it's it's Kohler, you know, where the, all those toilets and faucets are made. He lies resting there in the town of Kohler. And uh, um, I never knew the man. I heard a lot of stories about him, but uh, um, I'm always grateful because uh, you know my great grandparents. Because they did something I'm not sure if I could do, you know. And again, I, I like to think I'm, you know, I've endured. But uh, these these were folks who really had, you know. They were the they were the pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know. They were the streets are paved with gold, you know. And and now my friends are talking about they want they only want a, a four or five, you know five hour day, you know, at work. They only want to work four days a week. They don't, they don't want to work five days a week. My great grandfather worked 16 hour days and sometimes six days a week. And they didn't complain about it either. And uh, it doesn't mean they liked it, but they didn't complain about it. And uh, and so it wasn't a first class ride over to America, it was in steerage. But I sure, you know, excuse my French, but I'm sure the hell glad that they did. And they had the, uh, you know, they had the strength and conviction to leave, um, you know, my great-grandfather left Ukraine. And he left for a lot of reasons, but uh, mostly he was looking for a better life. And, uh, and I'm the beneficiary of that. So I like, to, I like to think we've all been riding on the coattails of our ancestors, you know. And we owe them something, you know, at least their memory. And uh, I'm not sure I could do it, man. Could you do it? You know, if someone said right now... You are going to leave America. We're going to send you to a country you've never been before, and you don't know the language, man. And and guess what? It's just the clothes on your back and a couple of shekels in your pocket. Mm -hmm. You know? Could you do it? I doubt seriously. Yeah. yeah. So I think about that, you know, and uh, um, and that's where this song came from. It's, uh, it's called Green in the Land of Gold. We were kind of naive, you know. We got off the boat at Samuel Ellis Island, 
we thought the streets were paved with gold and before we even you know did anything someone handed us a shovel and said you do the paving man and, and you know that's the way that's been for better or worse right if you drive around my town of Sheboygan which still has a lot of light industry and plastic and paper and a lot of manufacturing every company has got a help wanted sign outside every company it has been going on a long time now we can find people want to do the job people who live there don't want the job you know so we've always needed labor that's willing to do the jobs and people who've been there a long time don't want to do anymore or whatever the reason might be you know but someone should do those jobs because a country that doesn't make things anymore that's a slippery slope that's a slippery slope. Did we learn that during the pandemic? Yeah, it's a hard lesson, you know. So, so here's to those who came before. May we, may we remember their tenacity and their working spirit that, uh, you know, let them take pride in their work and work, work those long days and uh, make this country great, you know. We were green in the land of gold. Where did your families come from? Holler out the name. What countries? Holler them out. Sicily. Sicily. Syria. Syria. Germany. Ireland. Latvia. Latvia. Poland. So you see, we are that melting pot that they always used to talk about. And when I was in seventh grade and it was civics class, do they even have civics class anymore? Oh, they do. They ought to. If they don't, because, you know, we, we, we had to memorize things like, bring me your tired, hungry, huddled masses, right? Emma Lazarus inscribed at the base of the Statue of Liberty, right? <laughs> on relief we were those huddled masses in the streets work the day with my friend get up and ride that train again happy we were and will be in this old eternity that's the way the story goes Lights of a liberty were burning proud At Ellis Island we all walked down I pulled my cap underneath my head Five cents for a loaf of bread Twenty-five cents for a place to make my bed Machines they rattled and the push cart rolled Down on the Bowery the wind blows cold Where hearts are won, love is lost and sold Ain't nothing guaranteed in this life Sometimes all you got is what you think is right Eighty hours on a dollar make a poor boy wanna fight Work the day with my friend Get up and ride that train again Happy we were and will be In this old eternity That's the way the story goes Utah Phillips, one of my songwriting heroes He used to say the past didn't go anywhere Sometimes 
I like to just kind of close my eyes on those summer days and I, I raise up my screen window at my home and I put my, my ear out towards the street and I listen real close and I, I close my eyes and sure enough, on a, it doesn't happen all the time, but on a good day I can channel it. And I can hear them coming, man. They were your ancestors too, you know. And they're pushing their little carts down the street, those peddlers. And they're hollering out, you know, hawking their wares. And, and if you listen close, you can still hear them today, you know. They're out there. You'll hear them. They're saying, Riggs! Schmatez! Ice! Ice! Coal! Coal! Milk! Milk, milk. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You all had enough yet? No? That's a real good question. You know? <laughs> One of these instruments up here is a prop, at least, that I will not play. Um, so, which one is it? Ban well, you know, the banjo always gets a bad rap, so it's most likely liable to be the one, don't you think? Mm. You know, and the jokes aren't even funny, you know. How do you get a professional banjo player off your front porch, pay him for the pizza? And all <laughs> so, but you guys are really kind. Well, it's the difference between a large pizza and a professional banjo player. A large pizza can feed a family of four. <laughs> what do you say to a professional banjo player in a three-piece suit? May the defendant please rise. <laughs> What's the difference between a harmonic and a banjo? A harmonica, no, banjo only sucks, no, harmonica sucks twice as much as a banjo. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll. I'll hear that and I'll, I'll see you one more. How about, <laughs> what's the definition of perfect pitch? When you toss your accordion into the dumpster, it lands on a banjo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on all night, you guys. I'm not gonna do that to you. Why are there so many bad, bad banjo jokes? Why? Because banjo players spend half their time tuning and the other half playing out of tune. <laughs> So, so, okay, yeah, I guess, you know, let me see if I can play the banjo tonight. All right. Most banjos, the most sacrilegious thing you can do in this lifetime as a musician, plug in a banjo. <laughs> I do that just to really irritate some people. <laughs> You wouldn't want to see some of the places I play in. This is high society here at Focal Point, you know. But uh, you need a banjo in some of these places just to defend yourself. Let's do L and M. But uh, um, you guys will have to endure me tuning my banjo. Maybe I'll be able to muster another tasteless banjo joke. Or I could tell you a true story about um, the banjo. So I started playing banjo because when I was teaching in college, my the dean of the music department, he said, Little Rev, you already play all these instruments. I want you next semester to teach a lab for for um, you know for grade school and middle school music teachers. And what I want you to do is I want you to give them two or three weeks on every folk instrument. I said, well, that means I got to learn how to play the auto harp, and that ain't going to happen, you know. And he said, yes, it will. He said, you already play most of these instruments, and, you know, you got plenty of time to, all you got to do is learn enough to show somebody like a two-chord song, you know, something really simple. He said, I want you to do banjo, I want you to do guitar, recorder, ukulele, a bunch of instruments, and, uh, and then they can go in the classroom and at least deliver a song on some of these instruments, possibly, right? You know, so that's when I took up the banjo, when I had to, not because I wanted to, okay? 
but I, I'd been backing up old timey banjo players, a lot of fiddle music and bluegrass and old time stuff. So I was around the banjo all the time, you know, and uh, I kind of fell in love with the banjo. Um, definitely not my first instrument. But uh, um, one of my favorite banjo players is uh, a friend of mine from California, Fred Starner, who always wanted to be Pete Seeger. And he, uh, he'd come to Wisconsin and do some gigs a couple times a year. And, uh, and one, one, you know, one year we were doing, doing a show, and, uh, uh, and afterwards we always go, you know, I rarely ever eat before a show, so when this show is over tonight, I'm going to be starving, you know. I'm going to eat at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, which is often a losing proposition, you know. And so we went out to this little Mexican restaurant, and we're sitting there. And, uh, um, you know, I had convinced him that he didn't have to bring his banjo in, and he had, like, a white lady, which is like a four or five thousand, six, seven, eight thousand dollar old instrument. And I, I, I convinced him because he wanted to bring it into this restaurant. I said, you know, my minivan is secure. I got an alarm. I'm going to cover up with that army blanket. You know, we're, we're practically right next to where we're parked, you know, so... You don't need to bring it in. It's always crowded. It's a small little place, you know. So, and I'm leaving all my instruments out in the van. And so finally I convinced him to leave his, you know, great banjo out in the van. And and uh, we have a blast. Margaritas, burritos, you know, tostadas, all the, all the whole works. Come out about an hour and a half, two hours later, I look in the back of my minivan. has got a busted window. And I'm thinking, oh, man. Now I'm going to have to give him like three, four grand, you know, just... I talked the guy into leaving his banjo out there. We walk up to the back of my van, and I look in the back of the van, and somebody put two more banjos in there. All of our instruments were still there. You guys walk right into that one. All right, play a little intro.
Yeah. yeah. Please. Since we're on the banjos. So a, a gentleman owns a bar and he notices that it's Christmas and he doesn't have a band for New Year's Eve. So he calls a booking agent and says, Can, have you got a band? He says, this is a week before. I don't have a band. He says, well, look. So he's going through his book. He says, okay, I've got a banjo and accordion duo. I'll, I'll send you. He says, fine. I'll take it. Send it. They come. And the whole bar gathers around them and they are singing songs all night and they had the best time they get through the night the bartender comes up and tips them a hundred dollars and says you guys are great look is it possible that i can book you again for next year and they said uh yeah but can we leave our instruments here yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's awesome all right well um I think we got time for one or two more if I'm if if I'm right about that, and um, and I'm going to do a song that uh, um, I heard from a guy named Clarence Ashley, who was an old timey a banjo dude, and then a little bit later on I heard um, David Grisman and Jerry Garcia do this same same tune, and that's when I really kind of fell in love with it. Um, but as long as um, this is a banjo friendly crowd, <laughs> show you what happens when the banjo goes to the washer and the dryer. <laughs> Banjo ukulele. Walking boss. Yeah, all right. So, uh, this is a railroad tune. My last show was in Kansas City at the home of a fellow who um, worked on the railroad his whole life, so I worked up a lot of railroad songs because when you're playing at his house, that's the right thing to do. <laughs> you know, so. And I'm not talking about Folsom Prison or nothing like that. And those are good songs, but... Um. All right. So let's see here. Um, I'm not much of a TV guy, but every once in a while in the dead of winter, I'll, I'll watch a little Netflix. And um, some years ago, there was a series on called Hell on Wheels. And... Uh, um, yeah, it was a great series, and you know my kind of stuff, and you know I'm, I'm like you know like that kind of stuff, Deadwood, you know, westerny type of things, and um, but it was about the building of the transcontinental railway, and there's another thing we take for granted these days. We, we if you ride the train, and I don't know how many of you ever take the train, um, you don't have any any idea what it took to build a transcontinental railway. You know, um, the labor was unbelievably intense. It was extremely dangerous. People died every single day. And yet you had to keep it all moving along. And the person who was uh, in charge of keeping the work moving was a fellow named uh, the walking boss. And nobody liked the walking boss because he was trying to get as much work out of you all the time. Meanwhile, you're often working with a lot of folks you probably wouldn't have been hanging around with back in those days. And so the tensions were always high. One, uh, one old poet once wrote that underneath every railroad tie is an Englishman, an Irishman, a Chinaman. And we don't think about that when we're taking our little train rides. So here's my little intro, and then we'll segue into uh, Walking Boss. Mm -hmm. Ok. 
walking balls, walking balls, walking balls. Though I don't belong to you, I belong, I belong, I belong to that steel driving crew. Work one day. Walking boss echo, walking boss. No, I don't belong to you. Echo me now. I belong, I belong, I belong to that steel driving crew. Work one day, work one day, work one day, then go lay in the shanty too. Walking boss. Walking balls, walking balls. No, I don't belong to you. I belong, I belong, I belong to that steel driving crew. Say on that one chord now. I know there's a few folks here tonight. I don't want to pre presume that everyone's a overexcited little rev fan. Few of you sitting in the audience tonight were brought down here by over enthusiastic folk music fans. And now here you are having to listen to some old railroad song on a banjo ukulele. Yeah, that's my idea of a lot of fun on a Saturday night. But yet here we are. And politely, you wouldn't say it, but you're thinking, damn, how long does this show go on? <laughs> So it's, it's kind of that point of the night where we got to do like Al Jolson said. I always leave them asking for more. Maybe, maybe. I'm not easy, but maybe. If you all do like you did in my dream last night, unprompted, when this song is over, rising to your feet, hollering 10 more songs, 10 more songs. Maybe I'll do one more, maybe. It won't be too late to grab a CD or a t-shirt or a hat. I hope you'll sign my mailing list so I can let you know next time I'll be back in the area. This is the point of the night where I, I thank Tom over here for lifting me up and giving me some good rhythm and some leads and putting me up for the night. And uh, appreciate that. I want to thank everyone here at Focal Point for making me feel welcome and having me back again. All the volunteers and you guys are a great organization. I hope your fundraiser will will uh, will do a whole lot better than I I do some nights. And it, tonight I'm going to do pretty good, but some nights I make tens of dollars. <laughs> but we'll see what happens. I'm not offended if you don't do like what happened in my dream last night. Okay. It's getting late and it might be time to go home. I understand that. Walking balls, walking balls, walking balls. No, I don't belong to you. I belong, I belong, I belong to that steel driving crew. Work one day, work one day, work one day. Then go lay in the shanty too. Give it up for Tom, everybody. Right. Give it up.
up for a little laugh. Come on, let's <laughs> Don't tempt us. <laughs> hey, one more time for my buddy here. Help him out. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Do one on the baritone uke. Thank you, all one of you, yes. Yeah. Yeah, she she bought everything I had that had to do with the baritone. <laughs> Portuguese brought the ukulele to Hawaii in the late 1870s. Came in on the ship Ravenskrag. There was a, a recession in Portugal, so a lot of the workers went over to work on the plantations in Hawaii. And um, and some of them have to be instrument builders as well. And so pretty soon, with an abundance of woods like koa, they found themselves making instruments that they had been making in Portugal and uh, um, carrying on the, that modern tradition. And, um, and what was reminiscent of the ukule ukulele were some of the first instruments. And uh, the little tiny soprano, which I didn't really do much with tonight, was really all the goal. And then uh, later on, as it evolved, I mean, that was the heart and soul of the instrument right there. But as it evolved, um, you had a concert size slightly bigger, and then you had a tenor like this one right here, longer scale, a little bit bigger body. Um, as, as it got into the 20s and 30s, um, people started demanding, you know, more ukulele options, and production increased at Martin and uh, Gibson and Harmony and all these, Regal and all these companies that were building ukuleles. Uh, it wasn't until the 1950s that the baritone ukulele started taking off and getting popular. It was marketed, if you look at the old magazines, it was marketed to kids and women. And they just sort of made this mistaken presumption that, oh, kids and women won't, um, you know, want to play a big guitar. You know, so we're going to make, you know, shrink that guitar down. It's tuned just like a guitar, DGBE. So it's very similar to the guitar. And that's how they market. If you look at the pictures, it's always when it's a baritone. It's always, you know, women and kids holding a baritone. But yet everyone bought them. So it was just, you know, wrong marketing. Whoever got paid, you know, was, was not doing the right thing. So let me play this thing for you. Give you a little taste of uh, one last tune. And uh, it would help if I plug this cable in. It's a short circuit. <laughs> And it's kind of, that was not like an intentional thing, not realizing that I wasn't plugged in. I literally forgot to check that. And it's weird because this song is about forgetting. <laughs> you know? These days when I forget things, it bothers me a little bit more because I have, my mom's been in memory care for four years. And, uh, and everybody forgets something every day. My wife always tells me, she says, do you know how much goes through that head of yours all day long? Do you know how much you remember? And you're going to worry about one or two things that you forgot, where you put your car keys, things like that. You remember more than you forget, and as long as that keeps happening, you'll be okay. You know? But I go to visit my mom, and uh, this woman had a mind like a steel trap, I tell you. You know, and she could remember everything, things that nobody would ever remember. Everyone's birthday, everyone's, I mean, everyone's, you know. She didn't have Facebook helping her, reminding her whose birthday it was. But she has pretty much outlived everybody in the memory home now. My dad goes to see her every day. Brings his little Bluetooth speaker. My dad's 90 years old. He's an old, he's an old time bodybuilder. He, he was lifting weights before there was a gym on every corner, and he still goes to the Y four days a week. And it served him pretty well, you know. And uh, so he goes to see her, and he takes out his little Bluetooth speaker, and he plays all of my mom's favorite songs that he knows 
because she knew, you know, 42nd Street and Oklahoma and Chicago and Guys and Dolls and, you know, um, every every old Broadway show, she knew all the songs and then all the pop stuff too. So he'll just go from one song to the next. But guess what? She remembers all the words. She could not tell you what she had for breakfast and a whole lot of other things she couldn't tell you, but she remembers every word. So here's what I say. If you want to find Marsha, my mother these days, you just play some of her old songs and that old spark comes back, that twinkle in her eye, she'll get up, you know, sometimes just do a little bit of dancing even and, you know, just singing along and that spark just comes right back. And that's how you find her if you really want to find the old, the old Marsha, you know. I, fi I find she's becoming more and more withdrawn as time goes on. She's already broken the record and lived longer than a lot of folks said she would live. And I knew that as an artist, pretty soon there'd be a song about memory. I wasn't going to force it, but I knew it would come. And the stats say that one in three or one in four of us in this room are going to be Marsha someday. It's heartbreaking, man. She's being well taken care of. She's being well loved by her family and even some of her friends. You want to find out who your true friends were? I'm watching it all the time. They, they all fell away. There's two of my mom's old friends regularly come to visit her. Everyone else forgot about her. You want to find out who your friends were? Get dementia, unfortunately. And you'll see who comes to visit you. Everybody else just forgets. And there you are sitting lonely. Unless you've got family members who don't want to leave you behind. It's, it's heartbreaking, man. It's heartbreaking. And my dad was never a rich man, but invested what he made well. Already blew through $450,000 in four years, paying nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month, you know. And uh, so save your shekels. Get that long-term care insurance that you don't think you can afford right now because you're going to need it. They always say you should leave on a happy note. <laughs> but I've never been one to follow what other people say. I mean, I, I was a teacher. And I knew I wasn't going to do it anymore, so I applied for a home loan, quit my job, and bought a house. They don't teach you those kind of things. You just you do it because you follow your heart. I set myself up so I couldn't fail. Did I make a good decision? So far, so good. train won't somebody tell me where it's gone it's a sad lonely day when your memory starts to fade then like a summer day it passes on the only thing i know is the music never goes everything else just slips away the only thing that's clear are these melodies i hear while i'm digging my own grave while I'm digging my own grave What to do with my brain? Did I leave it in the rain? Won't somebody tell me where it's gone? It's a precious thing When you remember everything Then like a summer day It passes on the only thing that's clear are these melodies I hear. Everything else just fades away. The only thing I know is the music never goes while I'm digging my own grave. While I'm digging my own grave. my brain did it wash on down the drain won't somebody tell me where it's gone so much yet to do if i could only tie my shoe like a summer day i'm passing on where to put my keys won't you tell me please 
Yesterday I lost my phone I'm standing in this room But I forgot what I was doing Lord, I feel so alone Lord, I feel so alone Lord, I feel so alone Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you to John. Thank you to Jeff. Thank you, everybody. All the volunteers for being here. Appreciate it. And thank you to Maplewood Youth Group, too. Travis, for spreading the word. Thank you, Travis.